I'm here to introduce Billy Grace Lynn, who's our visiting artist for this evening. And she is a graduate of the San Francisco Art Institute and has shown at various venues of national and international importance. Um, and I'm just going to let her uh, talk about her work, but before we start the lecture, I wanted to make a few brief announcements. One is that tomorrow is a jam-packed day, if you haven't heard. We have the BFA and MFA uh, graduation reception at 7 o'clock and at 5 o'clock, I believe, in this room. We have the MFA Oral Defenses, uh, which are open to the public. So uh, if you get a chance, come on by, and you can see some of our very best graduate students uh, talk about their work. So, I um, have to tell you, I took a tour of your graduate studios today and saw some amazing work and met some amazing people. I can say from going all over the country and some parts of the world that you have a great program going on here. And so you should be really happy. It's a real honor for me to be invited to speak with you because I can tell from what I've seen uh, you're all very busy, especially right now. And so it means a lot to me that you've shown up to hear what I have to say. And I hope that something I say will be of use to you, and if it's not, then you can just laugh later and forget it. <laughs> Meg um, took me out to dinner last night and I've had a wonderful time with her, and I've met Judy um, over a year ago. I've known her for several years, and I also know Joelle and Owen Monday. So I feel like I'm kind of connected to you, and I kind of know um, a little bit about you. So. Um, I, have, I, I was trying to think, driving up here, because I drove up from Miami, uh, what I would like to say to you. And uh, I came up with sort of a plan to do my uh, talk a little differently. So I hope you'll put up with me if I stutter over parts of it. Um, I wanted to say how I became an artist, because I think it was a little different trip. Um, I was studying religion and philosophy, and I uh, was a uh, sophomore, and my mother became ill with cancer and began, um, began sort of a terrible illness that resulted in her death. And I was present at her deathbed, um, and she couldn't speak, she was so ill. And she was breathing her last breaths. And the last thing she said to me, without any words, was she couldn't speak. And I waited there holding her hand as she breathed her last breaths. And then I knew which one was the end, because it was so long between them. And at that point, I reached over and I kissed her. And in the same way that the ancient Greeks would inhale the last breath of their fallen comrade. I inhaled her final breath into me. And I thought about her life. I'm originally from this moment. And she was not given an education because girls of her generation weren't generally offered a college education. And I realized that I had a, a duty and an obligation to her that I felt really moved by. So I decided to live the life that she would have led if she had had the choices that I had. And she always wanted to be an artist. So at her deathbed, I decided that that's what I would do for her. I would become an artist. So I changed my name to her name. So when I go to visit her grave, I see my name on the headstone. And then I drove to California, and no one knew me there. So they accepted the story I told them about who I was. They accepted me as an artist. And so I learned from that experience is that we absolutely become who we say we are. So you have to be very careful about who you say you are and how you live because that's who you become. 
And then I realized that culture is also a story that we tell ourselves. And this country is telling a certain story that I think is problematic for the environment and for the world. And so in order to change that story, that cultural paradigm, we have to change the story that we tell about. So what I realized <clears throat> at my mother's deathbed was that when she exhaled and died, there was a change in the room. It was her body was still there, but this energy that had been inside of her was gone. And from my study of philosophy, I realized that this re-inscribed the whole Descartian idea of the, the separation between the body and the soul, which I knew at that point was a misunderstanding. So when I went to California, I worked out at the Headland Center for the Arts for a while, and I would walk along and I would pick up dead animals and hang them in my studio. They were pretty disgusting. <laughs> But at one point I was walking along the beach and I saw a small uh, pelican being moved in and out through the current action on the beach. And looking at it, I watched it move, the waves moving its body. And I realized that only a um, pelican could move in such a way that the articulation of its body, the fact of its physical shape, was really what it was. And it was at that moment that I realized that when someone dies, it looks like the soul leaves the body. But actually, the body and the soul disappear simultaneously because you can't have a soul without a body. And you can't have a body without a soul. It just takes longer for the body to disappear. But they're both gone. So all of my work, I mean, it took me, I hadn't had any art framing, so what was I going to make? I had somehow managed to get into graduate school, which is a whole other story, to study art. And I didn't know what to make. i have never made anything, really. So my first efforts were about trying to re-articulate the body and find out about embodiment. If it's true, what is the body and what is, what is the body's relationship to the soul? So I'm going to show you some works where I started. And what you're going to see is that I started with a very private, personal question, and then it became political, and now it's even going beyond for me the political. <coughs> and um, it's been an interesting journey. And so for you young people starting out on this journey, uh, have fun. It's just a hell of a good time. And um, may you find that answers to your questions or maybe more questions to your questions. So let me show you some of the work I've been making and then um, I want to spend some time if you have any questions. So when I was a girl I always wanted a horse but I never got one. And then at some point when I could have had a horse I decided that I would build my own. And so this horse is a representation of what it means to sublimate your desire. So it's when you, instead of getting the convert convertible, you uh, get the Subaru with the sunroof. <laughs> you know, so I made this mechanical horse. Now, I could go into what the horse represents, <coughs> especially to young girls, but I think you're probably um, aware of at least some of that. Do you know what I'm talking about? Have you noticed that young girls like horses and more horses? And what, have you ever thought about those ideas? So this has always been the work of art, to inspire the senses, to make the body feel without necessarily direct experience, through signs, color, sounds, movement, and so on. At its highest, the experience and the making of art are identical. Accordingly, my work is usually interactive and kinetic in nature. I strive to make pieces in which the viewer interfaces both the form and the function of the piece. I want people to remember themselves in the same way that babies discover their fingers. When my work is successful, the participant goes forth more aware and delighted in being a body. 
That, and that paragraph is my artist statement. So I have on occasion ridden along, uh, ridden around campus on my horse. This is called my high horse. <laughs> and the most amazing thing about it is people know exactly what I mean. You know, I'm just greeted by smiles because they know exactly. There's a woman who always wanted a horse and she finally got one. <laughs> and that's exactly what it means. <laughs> I've done a lot of work that's about uh, women's bodies especially. And so this particular piece entitled Woman is about the manipulation of the female body. It requires at least four people to move it. And it's very interesting, uh, you can hoist it up. Some people figured out how to hoist it really far up and then they would drop it. And I hate to say it because it sounds kind of stereotypical, but the most vicious people who manipulate all of my work all the time are Asian women. <coughs> and, I, and it's because of this repression, right? They're very, very repressed especially, I think, in this culture, because there are these, uh, there's this expectation on them. I'm going to click through a lot of this work uh, quickly. So art has always been the site of replication. For example, the Pygmalion myth concerns a sculptor creating a perfect woman, so perfect that Venus brings her to life. Even Descartes apparently built an automaton supposedly so lifelike that a captain threw it overboard. So there's no doubt that we're going to replicate ourselves at some point in the future. It may take 20 years and it may take 200 years, but we are going to do it. One thing to remember is that it was 60 years from the Wright brothers' flight to our landing on the moon. 60 years only. So our question and our problem now as a, as a people is how much of what we are as bodies, how much of our humanity is going to be able to get transmitted into the technology that's coming. And I have terrible concerns about this because it's already happening. I was telling them earlier that last year I had a student uh, who did not know how to tie a knot because he's always clicking. I could not tie up a knot at all. Here's <clears throat> he had slip-on shoes. <laughs> I looked. <laughs> this is um, a hand. It's just an articulated wooden hand with a very simple balance mechanism on top. It allows the uh, viewer to touch it. And what happens is you look at the car hand for a while, but then you begin watching your own hand as it mirrors the moving hand. So we're primarily tactile, meaning that what we're able to physically touch and manipulate is what we most fully understand. Our intelligence is not just in our heads, but it's in our bodies as well. Jack Burnham, who is a, a critic, argues that the fundamental ambition of sculpture is the replication of life. We're now living in a digital age, one that's actively seeking electronic embodiment. But it's ironic that the most advanced research in many, if not most, technical fields involves the haptic sensation or the replication of the body through technology so that it will more closely approximate um, a real, a, a vir not a virtual experience, but a real experience. Now this is a complicated piece. This, uh, this piece was entitled Blackmail, and it was about confronting publicly my internalized and unadmitted racism. I needed to physically see and feel the stereotype that I had embedded in my own mind and body so that I could dismantle it. 
So the sculpture is an effigy of a mechanized and abstracted male flat body. It's lynched or pinned onto a structure that allows the fully articulated head to uh, interact with the participants. Specifically, you could French kiss this head. So when I showed this piece, people actually lined up to kiss it. So what happens is you get close enough to kiss it and you, your crotch hits this uh, phallic-like member. <laughs> and when that happens, um, the mouth opens and uh, a tongue comes out. And I, um, people were really horrified by this piece, piece and I was very horrified as well. It was embarrassing. But people lined up, they queued up to kiss it as a public sort of demonstration that was, I don't feel this way about anybody. It was very interesting. And um, I, I, have, I still have this piece, and I would obviously never sell it. Um, but it's um, <coughs> it very intense. So I investigate sculpt, uh, cultural stereotypes because we acquire identity and motivation as a kind of operating system. Then we have the task of discovering how much of it we want to keep because it makes us efficient, and how much of it we want to delete because it's problematic. So the problem is how to delete it. And what I found is for making these sculptures is that if I could physically move my body, like children when they play, they enact things. And if you can enact physically another behavior, it changes your mind. I think this is so important. It's more important than just reading about it. You have to do it. You have to enact it to make it real. After the 9-11 attacks, everyone where I lived in Pennsylvania stayed inside their homes watching television. So I decided to make a public sculpture uh, out of, I made this, all this furniture out of cement so that people could uh, come outside and, and talk about what was happening. The television set was set to the uh, river behind it. This guy sat down and, and uh, I said, what do you think about what's going on in the world and this war we're having? And he said, we're going to have another goddamn Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And he was kind of right. So it was through this piece I realized that I needed to make more public works, things that were not so private. I worked with my students uh, very often. This was, uh, this was, uh, we made this because of the anthrax attacks. So I don't know, you were probably kids when this happened, but, you know, they told us to get plastic sheeting and duct tape. Does anyone remember this? And prepare a safe room. And uh, living in Pennsylvania, we had had the attacks in Washington and the field in Pennsylvania, and so it was kind of crazy. So we would walk around in these hazmat suits with these fans, and uh, the animosity, people threw snowballs at us and hurled uh, insults. They thought we were being unpatriotic. But what we discovered is that it was very interesting to make <laughs> interventionist work uh, as a way to sort of disarm the energy around what was happening. <laughs> so daily life is a con contested territory. I mean, where can you be? What can you do? It's all privately owned. It's all government. It's owned by the government. So the only thing that you own is your body. So it was a great realization that if I could put it on my body, I could walk around with it. So I thought I have to get out of the, the uh, gallery system and the museum system. I need to be out in the world. <laughs> so what I began to see is that work that allows physical interaction our work that's made by a group becomes embedded in the participants as a form of an operating system. It's a symbolic system. And it's and it the whole new belief system then becomes embodied. This is the Homeland Security vehicle, which uh, Meg knows about. Um, so what I did is I decided I would surveil the government. 
So I found a wheelchair at a thrift store. I got a cafe umbrella and put these uh, very intense bird microphones around it so that I could have bionic hearing. Once this dome, I had eight microphones inside this dome, so once it's lowered over my head, I could hear everything, and I had a video camera filming everything. And um, I was very excited. I had all the Homeland stickers. <laughs> I had a way to show what the attack level was. And then I went to Washington, D.C. <laughs> and uh, this is Stuart Watson, my nurse. And I also had a Secret Service detail. If you notice, we were stopped about every 100 yards by a policeman. <laughs> if I had not gotten permits to do this, I would have been, we would have been arrested for sure. It was hilarious. To the White House. <laughs> People spit at us. It was very intense. I wanted to show you a little clip of it. And you can kind of get the feeling. It was uh, very hot on the mall. Is it? Do we have sound? Uh -oh. Yes, it's the uh, it's the Homeland Security vehicle. Oh, okay. <laughs> students and others here the books. Nature's eternal religion. Very interesting. Uh, people came in and washed the books and we made these small um, sculptures. 
there were thousands and thousands of them which are laid out on the red uh, ground. And it was very interesting what happened. We came together as a community. It was, and it was strong what we felt. We were all working together. And I was at that point reading some stuff um, on sociology and, and I ran across this thing of Emile Durkheim and he had this idea, you know, there's this long-standing idea that religions arose to explain natural phenomena. But his suggestion, or his, what he thought happened was that uh, this, when people get together and they're working on something, like at, or at a football game or a rock concert, there's a spontaneous uprising of this feeling that he called collective effervescence. And it's a very potent feeling that sort of makes people really engage with whatever they're doing. And I thought, that's what this is. This is sort of, um, we're meant to work in a collective. And I, I felt like this was really important for artists to think about because maybe it's not in a private art practice in your studio where we do our best work. Maybe it's rather when we're all together working on something as a group. So I decided to explore this <coughs> in other work. So this is a whale that I made in Florida. This I made right before I moved to Florida. This was entitled Moby Dick. It was obviously about our dependency on oil and Captain Ahab slash George Bush and the war and, and this sort of um, uh, very in, intense desire for um, what's it called? You know, the whale took Ahab's leg off. Revenge. That's it. All the people who carried the whale were Republicans. Um, they didn't want to carry the whale, but they did it for me. I did a Mickey Mouse I couldn't resist. This was during the height of the war. And um, people were very upset that I decided to kill Mickey and have blood coming out of his mouth, uh, forming a map of the United States. So I did this as a gorilla piece so I can inflate it. It's inflated with... Um, fans from a car, um, so I can put it out on the street, and I did put it out on the street, and then if the police come, I just unzip it, and it collapses, and then I just pick everything up and run. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what's really good? You have this to look forward to. When you get a little older, they don't mess with you as much. So they looked at me, and they thought, she looks like okay. <laughs> so they let me go now. They used, to, they used to do stuff to me. They don't bother me as much anymore. Um, I made a herd of elephants. And so, you know, I, I don't, I'm sure all of you know the expression white elephant. So a white elephant is something someone gives you and you can't get rid of. And in ancient times, people were given white elephants as a way to ruin them. So if like, someone wanted to destroy you, they gave you a white elephant because you can't have them work. They have to have special housing. They have to have special food. And so it would bankrupt people to got them. But for me, the white elephant, the white elephant in the room is what we're all not talking about. So in the one in the back, uh, I was able to open it and get in it. So I was like a big white maggot. And I sat inside there and I invited people to come in beside the dead elephant and write their white elephant, whatever it was on my clothing. So they would come in and the first fellow who entered the uh, elephant was a nine-year-old boy. And I, I said, do you know what a white elephant is? And he said, I think so. And I said, do you have one? He said, actually, I do. And I was like, my God, nine years old, you have, already have a white elephant. So he wrote, I was adopted. And I thought, my God, of course, that is his white elephant. But because he was the first person who wrote anything on my clothing, it changed the whole piece. So the next person who came in saw what he had written. So it became very psychological. And I sat, um, I've done this piece several times. I make a new um, maggot suit for each performance. And I have uh, different things that people say to me, you're right, it's, and it's always psychological. I don't look at what people are writing on me during the performance. 
I see it later, but I kind of remember. So when I looked to see what this young woman had written on me, that she had written I was great three times, it was um, devastating. My white elephant is my love for people who don't care for me. Then I decided I would let people paint them. And so now I'm in the process of allowing this sort of uh, group activity of painting the white elephants. And look what happens. I'm a terrible painter. <laughs> you know, they're beautiful. And they write things on them that I would never think to write, like trees have AIDS. That just blows my mind. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like it takes it right to the place where I don't understand, and I just love that. This apparently is a famous graffiti artist, Pink. I don't know who that is, but some of it was just amazing. And then I, I continue to do uh, work with marionettes or animal bodies. This is a recent work. <laughs> <laughs> the um, chihuahua, it's very interesting watching the chihuahua. <laughs> my self-portrait, and no one believed me, but it is. So I made the body from wood, and then I found an actual rabbit pelt and covered the wooden part with the pelt, and it was too cute, and so I covered it with gesso which makes it look sort of wet and disgusting. Um, and there's something really kind of <coughs> sweet about it. I miss it. And um, this is uh, my Obama kite. <laughs> it's about 10 feet tall and 6 feet wide. Churchill that, uh, you know, you, a kite only flies against the wind. And if you think about his uh, presidency so far, when he's really successful is when he is sort of going against uh, the tide or against the grain, when he begins to try to, well, this obviously is my opinion, but since I'm not in the classroom, what a relief, I can just have my opinion. Right. I'm going to fly this uh, in D.C. Uh, next year. I'm going to be on sabbatical, so I'm planning on taking it up there. And then this is the last body of work uh, I'm going to show you. I um, have become very, very concerned about the environment. This is my thing now, the environment. It's been my thing for about 10 years. Um, Someone told me the other day that if you, the, all the animals that Americans eat in a year, 10 billion animals slaughtered a year, would stretch to the moon and back five times. And that is just the United States. So if you think about all the crap and pee and antibiotics going into the water supply, just that, not talking about the gas from the cows and the production of the soybeans and corn to raise them. The production of meat in this country is the second largest emitter of greenhouse gases. It's not cars. It's factory farming. And the first uh, polluter is the production of energy, so the oil companies and the gas, the math. And number two is animal production. 
and number three for carbs. And so if we just cut down on our meat eating, that would help a lot while we try to figure out what to do. So I'm, I'm going to be on sabbatical next year, so I'm doing a, a whole uh, body of work and a performance. This is the crucified cow. People didn't like this in Miami. I don't really know why, but it, that piece wasn't particularly well received. It's a performance. <coughs> This is the golden calf. It's a, uh, a calf that's been gold leaf with real gold leaf. Took forever. Cost a fortune. And it's about this sort of, you know, when you ask people, can you cut down on meat or would you give up meat? There's this like fear. People immediately kind of clench down. It's like, if you, but if you say, what would you do to save the earth? I would do anything. Well, can you give up meat or can you cut down? I don't know. Uh, maybe. I don't know. I mean, we have to have meat. I'd feel weak if I didn't have meat. <laughs> I would not eat meat if my husband didn't eat meat. I get that a lot. This is, uh, all, I make models of almost all of my work. I advise you to try to make models of what you're doing. This is the image that you use for this lecture. This is my Mad Cow bicycle. So what I did is I, um, I had a complete cow skeleton that uh, is I put on an electric bicycle. And I rode around Miami on this. And that's my utter This is about three minutes long.
and talk with them about this. And I'm hoping, I'm, I'm going to be driving through the many areas of the United States. I'll be coming through here, by the way. Um, just to sort of be humorous, because how can you, you know, I'm wearing a better helmet. You know, just to try to break it up a little bit and um, talk about these issues. So I want to leave you with thoughts before we could have a conversation maybe that I want you to think about. Life, you know, your life, the thing that's in you that's alive has never been dead. Think about it. Life doesn't come from death. It comes from life. And so that spark, that thing in you that's alive has been passed down to you through the eons from the time you were oozed in the mud. This life on earth is so precious, every little bit of it. And I hope you'll consider, as you're making work, because we're the people who make these images that change people's minds, that you might consider thinking beyond your own personal expression to express something that might help the world as a service to others. One of my favorite artists, Joseph Boyce, said this. He said, art is the only political power, it's the only revolutionary power, it's the only evolutionary power, it's the only power to free humankind. Art has to be developed as a weapon to achieve positive change. And these questions are aesthetic. So that's it. Thank you so much. Anybody have any questions for Billy? How did you get permission in Washington for the, for the permits? You know, it took six months. Uh, one of my colleagues in the art department has a sister who works for the state <coughs> And I told her what I was planning to do, and she said, you better get permits. And so I had to write to the National Park Service, the D.C. Police, the Secret Service, and the Capitol Police. So there were four agencies involved. And I'm sure I have an FBI file list that is pretty funny. And, they, and we got permits. But if we hadn't gotten the permits, it would have been over that first time it got stopped. So did you just show, you had the permits on you, you showed? Yeah, they were carried on us. That's what the police were looking at every time they stopped us. Every hundred yards we were stopped. And they were not happy at all. But it was exciting. It was wonderful. <laughs> Great talk, Billy. I want to press replay. <laughs> um, quite a few things struck me uh, that I'd like to have a further conversation with you about. One, that you are who you say you are become who you say you are. That's really wonderful. Um, I've played with your hand before on a couple of occasions. Okay. I've always wanted to meet you, so it's a pleasure in that respect. But I'm most curious for you to uh, further elaborate on the statement you said is beyond political. Can you articulate that? I think I understand, but can you articulate that in just a few sentences to make you that your work becomes beyond political? Well, I think, you know, our political system really works to have the same duality of me against you, or us against them, that is not effective at all. And so I want to go to a place where people aren't sure where I stand, a place that's larger than the political system to try to get beyond, to get to those things that are really important, you know, like saving the earth for your grandchildren. That's what I'm talking about before it's too late. And I don't think it's too late. If I thought it was too late, I would have killed myself a long time ago. But we have to do something right now. It's not for another generation. Did that answer your question? Yes, thank you. I was worried y'all wouldn't have any questions because that's a sign of a bad talk. <laughs> yes? Um, where do you get your um, old cow skeletons? You know, that's a story. <laughs> I'm going to tell you because you won't believe it, but it's true. So when I, I went to school at Tulane University, 
and I took a sculpture class my last semester in school, you know, because of my mother. And I had a close friend in Pekin, Mississippi, and I would go out to his little farm, and his dad raised cows. And when the cows would die, he would haul them away onto a cow mountain of bones, dead cow mountain. And I went out there, and I saw this. It was up to the height of that board, just with cow skeleton. And I looked at it and said, H.M., hey, can I have those bones? And he said, what are you going to do with them? And I said, I don't know. I picked them up when I was 21 years old. And I carried them with me for 25 years. Everywhere I moved, I moved to, from San Francisco to New York to Seattle to Pennsylvania. And in my last move to Pennsylvania, I had these monitor boxes, you know, big monitor boxes because we didn't have flat screens. And I had 30 monitor boxes full of bones. And the movers would look and say, cow bones. And he's like, lady, what's in these boxes? And I said, cow bones. And he said, are you kidding? And so I opened them up because it was thousands of dollars. The university paid, but thousands of dollars from a print cow bones. So he said, why? And so I told him the story. I had to pick them up. I had to use them. And he shook his head. He said, you know, I've heard of people carrying their grandmama's four poster bed everywhere they moved, but never, in the minute he said a bed, oh, oh God, God, <laughs> I'm going to make a bed. I'm going to make my death bed, my bone bed. <coughs> well, people have asked me that, and people have wanted to rent it. <laughs> it's been interesting that people have wanted to rent the bone bed, but, you know, I haven't rented it. Keeping it. I'm, I'm hoping that I'll get to die in it. That's my goal. Because I would like to give the gift, the, that would be, that's ultimately my final project, is a public death. Because I found that so important. How many of you have seen someone die right in front of you? So a lot of you. I mean, you got to admit, there's something. You know, you need to see birth, and you need to see death, so that you really understand how precious life is. And once you have both of those things in your mind, then not much bothers you. You know what I mean? Life is short. You need to get out there. Because what are they going to do to you? Kill you? It's kind of dumb. What are you hanging on to? You're on borrowed time. Right now, you're on borrowed time. <coughs> I want to thank you for your message. You're a great inspiration to all of us with your sculptures. They're all awesome. You know, um, the way with the elephants and then the motorcycles, or the bicycle with the bones. And especially, how did you make your uh, strings inter inter uh, interact with the viewers? And how did you learn that technology of using that force and different balance? You know, I um, I love engineering. I was, I was talking to Jordan about this. Jordan here? There you are. I was talking to Jordan about this. We both have this love of mechanisms. But I never have gotten much beyond the pivot. You know, I've been able to do a lot with just a drill in a hole and putting a nail in it. <laughs> and, you know, it's, it's one of the reasons that I haven't really pursued digital stuff, even though I've played with Arduino and, and doing, and I, I plan to try to do some of that in the future. But what happens for me is that I realize that it sort of takes something from my idea that we have to be embodied. You know, that somehow I have to touch this thing. The best example I can give you is if you've ever been to a jewelry store and you're looking at stuff and you look at the lady and you say, you know, can I um, see that ring or that watch? And you don't mean see, right? It means you want to touch it. Because you can't see what you don't touch. Another example I'm sure you've all had is if you take a map, if someone's trying to show you directions, you have to be holding the map. Have you noticed this? In order for you to see where you need to go, they can be holding it, but you need to take it. There's a lot there. We need our bodies. These things didn't, these are our evolutionary vehicle to see and experience the world. 
These things are important. Where in Louisiana are you from, and do you have any artists that inspired you initially to start into aesthetic sculpture and the love sculpture? Well, the first thing I saw, of course, as a, as a sculpture student is Calder, right? And I must, I'm sort of like those ducks that imprint on their mama. So I have a foot on Calder, and another foot probably on Duchamp or George Rickey, the kinetic sculptors. In New Orleans, it's very interesting. Uh, Lynn Emery and Emery Clark, who were both female sculptors, they were both kinetic sculptors, in, and they were around to Lynn. And George Rickey, who's a kinetic sculptor, uh, taught at Lynn. So I'm sure that had a lot to do with it. Well, I'm from well, I'm from north of the lake, uh, in the middle of Mississippi. Where are you from? Gulfport, Mississippi. So you know where Picking is. So that's where I picked up all those poems. And um, yeah, that place, you know, was when I drove up here, I realized that Miami is not the south. When I drove here, I thought, oh my god, I'm from in a way, because this must be about the same longitude as where I'm from. And I had a hard time growing up. You know, uh, I was not acceptable for my family um, or the people around me. I was really shunned. And so the minute I could get out of there, I left for California and really have not gone back much. I found it very impressive as a woman. And I haven't been back since the hurricane. I'm devastated about it because I know it's changed the city. But still, I can't get rid of this accent. Like stuff on <laughs> I see people when I travel around the country, when I open my mouth, the, their lids kind of, there's a lens that goes over because they think I'm some uh, redneck hick. You know what I mean? And maybe I am, maybe I, maybe I am. <laughs> it's such a relief. Hey, I asked for a really hard question from you. What's the hard question? How do you tell everybody about your project? Are you going to use Facebook? I am. So what I'm going to do, and maybe some of you can help me. And actually, I need another cow skeleton. Uh, if anyone knows of where I can get a complete cow skeleton, um, I'm going to take off next spring, and I'm going to set up a Twitter and a GPS system so that you can track my journey. And if people want me to come through and make veggie burgers or give a talk, maybe I can come back here. This could be one of my stops. Mm -hmm. And then hopefully one thing will lead to another. I'm going to go, I, it's going to be a remake of Easy Rider. Because I feel <laughs> like I need to go back to Louisiana and drive along those levees, see my peeps. <laughs> are you, and, are you um, cooking them on the motor? Are you, are you actually going to cook them on the motor like carburetor burgers? That's a good idea. But no, I'm probably going to have to have a chase car. I mean, there's a whole culture around that. I know. That's a great idea. I'll have to think about that. How do we do that? <laughs> Thanks for that idea. <laughs> you mentioned... Um, about the power of working in a collective. Do you have any stories you could share about um, since you had working with the collective? Well, the ones that I showed you were really important to me, but um, I think that the, when I realized this was true was actually a long time ago. I was very involved with the choir, with the church choir. And I would feel this sort of rising up in me when we would sing together. And that's why uh, it's so intense you know, to have like a community, a spiritual community, which I don't belong to. I wish I had that. I'm, I'm actually um, Buddhist. Um, what kind? What kind? Or in what branch? Well, I'm, I practice in Buddhism. Are you a Buddhist? Yeah. Yeah. And so um, I feel that, you know, in, in that culture, but it's not the same as as going to a church and singing those spirituals. The reason I was studying religion was that I thought I was going to be a priest. But they wouldn't have me. <laughs> I'm a, I was raised with this. Why are you a Buddhist? Uh, I'm from Seattle. 
of me. That being said, I, I'm not going against vegetarianism or, and I fully support the, um, the idea that there is something that needs to be done, but meat consumption per se, is that more a symptom of the real problem the way that the economic uh, stability of the country and the way the means of production are being controlled, isn't that more part of the issue rather than just eating meat? Well, th that's a really complicated. Well, I, know, I, got, I mean, that would take an hour, but I can say that. Um, I disagree with you about eating and uh, that we were designed for that and that has led to our brain development because I think that what they found, there's a great book called The Hand and I can't think of the guy who wrote it, but they used to think that the hips being able to stand upright was what led to our large brain. But what they discovered is that Lucy in those first fossils that we have of human, right. of human development could do this. And that if you uh, take someone, if, if babies who are born without hands or the ability to use their hands, they don't get brain development. That it's the hand actually that led to this. And one way to think about it is that if you look at the gut of carnivores, the gut of a lion, I think is six feet long. Our guts are 30 feet long. We have the gut of an animal that's supposed to eat primarily plant-based diet. And, and so I disagree with that premise. And just think about the colon cancer. They know that meat lodges in our gut and creates cancers all through it. So that's one thing. And the other thing is, you know, the market drives what we make. So consumption, people, you know, meat eating, it's very interesting because I haven't eaten meat now in like 15 years and I've been a vegan for about a year now. I didn't think becoming a vegan would be a big deal, but it's different. And I can't really, you have to try it. You can do it for one week and see the difference. It's a different feeling. Um, I think that if people didn't buy it, they wouldn't make it. And the way it's being produced is horrific. I mean, have you ever been to where they're? And the smell, have you driven through North Carolina lately? You can barely breathe there from the Purdue chicken stuff, and it's all going right like to the chest for bed. And men, look at their, your sperm counts. You have no sperm count compared to a man who was during World War II. That's why infertility is rampant. There are men who develop breasts because they're getting so many hormones from the dairy cows. 
because that stuff, when it comes out, when it goes into the water supply, it doesn't degrade. It's still antibiotic. It's still hormone in the water that we're consuming. <coughs> People don't want to talk about it. It's really weird. I mean, how many of you are vegetarians? Fantastic. In Miami, I, I know a handful of vegetarians. But we can't support a vegetarian restaurant there, really. It's bizarre. And you ask a Cuban to give up meat, and she's like, just kill me now. Just kill me now. Never a pig again. And I'm like, so that's why I say just cut down, because it's, you know, people are very intense about it. It's like you're, you want to put them in prison or something. Take away their freedom, take away their meat. <laughs> yes? How, how did you manage to change to a vegetarian? I don't mean to get strictly on the topic of this. Oh, well, you know, I read some literature and looked at some films about how animals are raised. And I couldn't eat it any longer. It made me sick. And, um, you know, I, I asked my uh, department chair if I could do a project where I could where I turned students into vegetarians. <laughs> she said, if you want to do human subjects research, you're going to have to write a grant for that or something. And I said, is this human subjects? I'm like, absolutely, it's human studies research. So, um, I, because I asked a student of mine, who's a mediator, I said, may I turn you into a vegetarian? He said, what do you mean, may you? And I'm like, because I know I can. <laughs> and he said, how are you going to do it? And I said, give me a week and let me show you some stuff and then read some stuff, and you'll be a vegetarian in a week. And he said, no, I don't want to see that. <laughs> so may I turn you into a vegetarian? <laughs> <laughs> I just want to say, it's not something we want to do without having a lot of attention and spending time and reading about, and you have to be very careful with your system because it's easy to get sick. I got sick from becoming a vegetarian. That's not typical, I mean, but I'm still sick. Right. What made so, you sick? Um, I'm allergic to beans. So I <laughs> so when I over, it just I sort of went septic. Oh so I can't do it. But I've never I'm, heard I'm a minority. I'm the one person who wanted to give up all meat. I've and never would heard of someone it. allergic to meat. So no. yeah. <laughs> I body won't process that. Wow. So I've never don't, met you know, no, you, you have to. I would honor a lot of you know things that your parents eat. You should eat. Our our culture has changed radically. And we have, are in the day with different types of food. So it's just not something you do on a Tuesday without patience. That's all. So. I agree with that. I think you have to be careful that you get an amino acid, for example. And I do take vitamin supplements to make sure. But I'm not doing this for health. Although it is very healthy, I feel a lot better. Uh, I'm doing it for the earth. You know, so when people say, well, you're not going to feel Well, I feel great. You know, I have more energy now. With the way that a lot of vegetables are processed in America now with the genetic modification, mm -hmm. do you think if more of America was converted to, I guess, I don't know if converted is the right word, so being a vegetarian, that it would contribute more to runoff into our waters and essentially... Are you saying that it, it's polluting to grow? And, yes, and right. Do you think that would well, possibly... You've got to go shift. organic. Mm -hmm. And right now, organic doesn't mean very much, yeah. you know, if you look into it. But a plant-based diet is definitely better for the environment than a total animal protein diet. So do you think America would be able, would be able to supply all of America with plants just by organically growing them? Absolutely. Them all American Absolutely. There is a guy in Michigan, he, he won the MacArthur Genius Award. He was a graduate of the University of Miami, and I can't right now, his last name's uh, it's not coming to me. But in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, he has greenhouses. And he has a whole sort of thing where he takes uh, plants and he does composting on a one-acre plot in Milwaukee. This is not Florida. And grows a million dollars worth of produce a year that's totally organic. Delicious. I mean, have you tasted? Have you ever had a little tomato? Yes. Maybe you have. Uh, you, but you know what I mean. When you go to a store now, you don't get a tomato. It doesn't. It's like this is not a tomato. I'm sorry. 
You know that they're splicing Arctic flounder genes into, into strawberries. Did yeah, you know that? A lot of weird stuff up there. Well, it's it's Pardon? Why? Why are they doing that? So that they can grow them in the winter. <laughs> it makes them uh, frost resistant. Because when I was a kid, you could only get strawberries in the summer. Now it's year round. We never had, we never had to wear sunscreen. Think about that. What are they? What are they mixing with the strawberries? I didn't hear what you said. Arctic flounder gene is mixed in strawberries that you can get at any grocery store. It's like a fish oil. No, no, it's the gene. They've taken the gene out of the Arctic flounder and spliced it into a strawberry. That's how we get strawberries year-round. So you've been eating fishy strawberries for years. <laughs> <laughs> this has been going on for at least 20 years. Well, this is a longer gives them a longer uh, shelf life. The tomatoes are also have a gene splice. I'm not sure what it is, but it also yeah. makes a longer shelf life. Right. And of course, you know, if you remember your biology, all this is well and good, but what happens is the bees take, they hybridize the strawberries and the other plants so that it all becomes genetically modified. And that fight, I have to tell you, is probably too late to fight. Okay, I have a comment. Yes. I remember reading at least 15 years ago where they were talking about GMOs and it's like this thing that might happen. And I was thinking, that'll never happen. If everybody knows what, what is happening, you know, what that means, no one's going to let that happen. And then it just happened. So I think it's important to point out what you were saying about work that could be political or that work that could be a message to send out because, you know, it's like educating. Yeah. People didn't understand that they didn't really even have a choice in that. It just happened without anybody asking. I assumed I would be asked. But I wasn't. More yeah. people know me. No one controls them. And but you should find out about it because it's very interesting. Isn't there something too where like it's not technically considered a food once the meat has been spliced and then the, the the food administration doesn't have to regulate it anymore because it's not technically a food? The FDA <laughs> don't get me started. And I think then we have to probably wrap okay. it up. Um, do you encourage us as artists to make more work that would have a political or environmental impact? How would you encourage as a young artist to really make that step into being more involved politically and or environmentally? Well, I think you just start doing it. You don't wait for an invitation. You don't wait for permission. You just, if no one gives you space, then you have your body. And then you just do a little bit so that you find your ground. Because I think it's really important that these, that whatever you make is aesthetic. Not in the sense that it's beautiful, because I think some great art is ugly. But that it holds together formally. Not formally necessarily in its shape and that kind of design element stuff, although that's pretty good too. But that it has a ground that you can stand on so that it's not just a sociology or a, a political, because you could, you, I mean, and a lot of artists have joined like the Sierra Club, and that's good. I mean, and I think that, and I, I'm a member of the Sierra Club, but I'm talking about making very sophisticated artworks that sort of hover so that they're really artworks. They're not just a, a flyer campaign. And I can't really explain how to do that because I don't know how to do it. But we, I'm trying to figure it out. We offer courses too that oh, really get you involved. So if you you know if you look at the course list, like um, Paul Rutovsky's class, get, the Get Green class. Um, so you know and Terry's art and, and yeah and Terry <coughs> Terry and Terry's art in action class. So so we offer classes. Oh, you like have that. an art in action class. <laughs> <laughs> See, y'all are so progressive. I mean, I'm going to go have to go back to the UM and go to Goss. People up in or the hinterlands are kicking our butts. <laughs> you know? yeah. Did you have a question? Yeah, I was interested in your use of vehicles and how it ties into your work other than uh, human powered bicycles. I, I, I think I understand that work a little bit, but how do you tie that into your mechanical work? Well, in the sense that um, I feel like our bodies are sort of our you know, vehicle or spaceship to explore this world. And so all work is a vehicle um, to take you somewhere where you haven't gone.
So it's like offering up for myself, because I make work for myself first. Um, so I can get somewhere in my own head or in my own heart or spirit. And um, so I want something that maybe is unknown, but not unknowable. Something that's transcendent. Does that answer your question? So it's all a vehicle. A painting is a vehicle. So you've got to find a really good question. You don't want to have answers. You want to have questions. That's and a really good question can take you a really long way. Have you ever abandoned the project? All the time. I've littered, and all the money I've ever made in my life is back there in the <laughs> litter. That's some of the hardest because once you commit a lot of time and money or something, it's really difficult to abandon it. But uh, that's that's the other thing is you need to have a core group of friends, your peeps who will tell you the truth, <laughs> you know? Not coddle you and say, oh yeah, you're doing great, I like it. But someone's like, that doesn't work, you know? And you, know, so, and you have to trust them. Don't have just anyone. You have to have someone that you can depend on to tell you what you don't want to see yourself, because you can't smell your own BS, right? <laughs> <laughs> and when you're the stinkiest, apparently that is when you really can't smell yourself. You know what I mean? <laughs> I hate to put it that way, but I see I'm in the middle of nowhere, but you get it, right? <laughs> so um, if anybody has any additional questions, I think Billy can answer some questions uh, up at the podium, and we're going to um, say goodnight for now.